Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is an author, historian and presenter. Tom Holland, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you very much for having me. It is great to have you here. Uh, we're delighted that you've come. But for anyone who doesn't know, you just give us a little overview of who are you, how are you, where you are, what is the journey that brings you to this chair uh, sitting here on the podcast, and we know you don't listen to podcasts, so it's, it must be a very special experience. For you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a journey of discovery for me. Yes, um, I'm a historian. Uh, I focus um, very much on um, antiquity, early Middle Ages, uh, and, and that might seem to make me wildly unsuitable for a, a topical podcast. But the degree that I have anything um, topical to say, it's because I'm interested in the way that things that happened in the deep past continue to reverberate into the present. Um, so uh, my most recent book, Dominion, um, is, is, is a book in which I look at Christianity as um, the most radical and transformative product of, uh, of the Roman Empire. And I think that um, the trace elements of that revolution continue to shape the way that uh, we think and behave today. And that's why we're so delighted to have you on the show, because whenever we've spoken to historians, you know, the idea that history operates in cycles is obviously not a new thing. It's sort of a dogma almost. Um, and it does seem like the current moment, uh, it's not the first time these sort of things have happened. So where are we on the spiral of history, Tom? Well, that's a huge question to kick off with. Um, that's I mean, why we've I, got an hour. Yeah, OK. Well, so, so, so I think that, um, I mean, I don't think that there are kind of hard and fast rules of history that you can extrapolate. But I think that, that if you look at certain cultures, certain ways of behaving, you can kind of extrapolate rules in which those distinctive cultures behave. And I think that the culture that we live in is, is one such. And I think that the rhythms that it moved to were laid down essentially by Christianity. And at the heart of Christianity is the idea, well, it's the idea of baptism, really. It's the idea of cleansing yourself. Um, and that obviously operates on the individual level. So the, the individual washes away sin and is welcomed into, into, in, into the order of light. But what happened in uh, Western, the Western half of what had been the Roman Empire, so Latin Christendom, as it's called, um, is that this becomes politicized. And in the 11th century, the idea that the whole of society can be cleansed, can be washed, can be awakened to a new understanding, kind of becomes institutionalized. And we may be tempted to think of the Middle Ages as a kind of hidebound reactionary age. But in fact, it's the first great revolutionary age in, in European history, because um, the, the, the radicals, the revolutionaries are the people who will establish the papacy as um, the great revolutionary order and the the cadres of people so whether it's it's people who are emerging in in these radical new institutions that emerge in the 12th century called universities whether it's it's the warriors convinced of their own rectitude who who, who take the cross to the ends of the earth jerusalem the baltic whatever people we, we, we now call crusaders um, whether it's the people who um, compile whole new understandings of of what law should be uh, institutionalizing radical new ideas such as human rights. All of these are expressive of, of a, a desire to set the whole of society on a new and moral footing that will be pleasing to God. And it, it sets in chain a process by which this happens again and again. Because, of course, what inevitably happens over the course of medieval history is that what in the 11th century had seemed radical and new and fresh, by the 16th century, when Luther pops up, seems hidebound and reactionary. And so the, the, the Protestant Reformation, although it casts itself as a reaction against, what, against the medieval papacy, in fact, is just another iteration of this desire to cleanse and purify society. And the same thing happens in the 18th century with the Enlightenment. Protestants had turned against the Catholic Church. In the Enlightenment, you get philosophes and French revolutionaries who turn against Christianity. And I think that these cycles of people feeling that um, society needs to be cleansed, it needs to be washed, it needs to be baptized anew, has continued and continued and continued. And it's so much a part of, of the West's cultural DNA that, that actually you don't need doctrinal Christianity to fuel it. And I think that, that, that what's happening at the moment 
therefore is just another iteration of these fundamentally very Christian kind of impulses. And it's interesting that you say that we've got these fundamentally Christian impulses, because when you look at certain things like the woke movement, it does appear to be a sort of religion, doesn't it? Where you have believers, you have non-believers, and the people who are non-believers or tend to criticise it get treated like apostates, don't they? Well, um, yes, um, American religiosity is is quite culturally specific. It's one that 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 you know originates in England. So there's a kind of Anglo-American model of Protestantism, which. Um, places a huge emphasis on the the role of the spirit kind of illuminating the soul and uh, allowing you to see um, what previously you hadn't seen. And um, these are called, you know, again, they happen in cycles because you get awakened and then you fall to sleep and then you get awakened (laughs) and you fall asleep. So they're called the great awakenings. And and historians of American religion trace them over, uh, you know, over, over a course of American history. And so that's why people have called what's happening now the great awakening. But, but, you know, it's, it's a pun, but it's not entirely a joke because that's exactly what it is. It's, it's exactly the, the same kind of idea that you have to look into your soul, recognize your sin and awaken to a new order. Um, specifically, what is happening, I think, is, is bred of what happened in the 50s and 60s, which was the last great overtly doctrinally Christian period of revolution and, and kind of moral reformation in America, which was the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement was um, very clearly drew on the inheritance of um, American Christianity. It's very biblically based. So um, it's black Christians doing as they had done since the the, the beginnings of of, uh, American Protestant society and looking at the stories of Exodus where God favors the slaves and rescues the saved and liberates them and leads them out of bondage to a promised land. And the resonance of that for black Americans in the 50s, and particularly in the South, was, was, was immense and believed, you know, literally. And it fuels the kind of, you know, the music, um, which then feeds into the music of the 60s. So it, you know, it's, it, it, it's deriving from these kind of hymns, these traditions, this language of liberation. Um, but of course, you know, the, particularly the Reverend Martin Luther King, he's a, he's, a, he's a clergyman, he's a Baptist clergyman, and he is drawing absolutely on um, the kind of fundamental Christian teaching that um, all human beings are created equally in the image of God mm. and therefore are endowed with a divine sense of dignity. And the, as Paul said, famously says, you know, there is no Jew or Greek. Um, so therefore there is no black or white. So what Martin Luther King is doing is summoning white Americans to a consciousness that their black brothers and sisters should properly be their equal. And the success of the civil rights movement is precisely that um, a majority of white American Christians accept the justice of what he's saying. I mean, that's why the civil rights movement succeeds. But what then happens in the 60s is that other groups of people kind of pick up on the success of what of what the civil rights movement has done gay rights movement would be an obvious one um feminism would be another and they're drawing on the same kind of impulses the same assumption that is kind of hardwired into christian discourse that um the first should be last that that those who are oppressed have have a value and a virtue by virtue of being oppressed um all of these are kind of drawn upon and that's why over the course of the decades that have followed you know by and large, people have have accepted the justice of what feminists or gay rights campaigners were saying in the 60s. But for for American Christians, it was problematic because there were huge, very, very deep traditions within doctrinal Christianity that opposed the idea of same-sex relations, um, were very um, committed to the idea that that, that the man should be the head. uh, that the, the man is Christ, to the woman is the church. Um, and so what's happened since the 60s really is that um, American evangelicals have come to identify ever more strongly as Christians. And um, those who, even though they are drawing on very, very Christian traditions, have come to see themselves as opposed to Christ- Christianity. And so you get the situation now where 
Um, you have uh, campaigners who are very overtly, see themselves as being very overtly anti-Christian. But I think that that's, that's kind of an illusion. I mean, these, what's happening at the moment um, is a civil war within Christianity. It's a, it's a civil war within different factions of the kind that, that, that has plagued Christianity over the course of its existence. So I think that, that, that to that extent, um, we, what we're witnessing is, is nothing particularly new. And it's fascinating that you say that. It seems to be a war within Christianity because one of the things that I've seemed to notice, and lots of people have said this as well, is that these people, although they may be overtly Christian in some of their values, they don't tend to believe in forgiveness all that much, do they? Well, th- there, are, there, are certain, um, there are certainly uh, things that have followed on from the fact that, um, well, what should we say, um, the woke, mm. uh, the, awake, the awakened, um, do not see themselves as Christian, see themselves as having emancipated themselves from Christianity. Um, because there, 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 there are um, certain um, impulses, I think, within human nature that, that Christianity has served to kind of bit and bridle. And um, the, one of them actually is, is the category of original sin, which I think ties into what, what you were alluding to. Original sin is, is, is absolutely the category that people in the 60s you know, who, who, who came to reject Christianity really hated. Mm. You know, it was everything the hippies were not about. The idea that we're all infected by sin because Adam and Eve fell. You know, absolute no-no. And so, so <coughs> it came to seem, you know, in the tune with, of, the, of the, 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 the 60s spirit, progressive spirit, um, that, that we're all born free. Um, you know, we're not born with original sin. And, and that seems, you know, I mean, who wouldn't want to sign up to that? But the... Cor- I think that we now see the, 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 the implications of that because it turns out that original sin is a very democratic <laughs> doctrine because it means that we're all sinners. Mm. We've all got fault. And one of the, one of the issues, I think, with, with, um, with what's happening is that there are large numbers of, of, of people who don't feel that they're sinners, who feel that they're liberated. Um, and, and, and ultimately, this goes back to... Um, and you see, this is why I, I love ancient history it, it goes back to the fifth century ad of course it does <laughs> and, and it goes back to an argument between two theologians pelagius who was this great burly britain the very first uh, british intellectual that we know of um, who argued that it was possible for christians to become perfect through their own agency so you could you know if you're sufficiently virtuous you can attain heaven through your own agency uh, and against this, you have Augustine, um, this kind of glowering, brilliant North African bishop who says, no, we are all saturated in sin. We're steeped in sin. We cannot get to heaven through our own agency. We depend on the, on the grace of God because we're all sinners. And it's, it's Augustine's doctrine that, that wins out. Pelagius becomes a heretic. Um, and... The 60s is a Pelagian movement because it's saying, no, we can become perfect. You know, this is the age of Aquarius. We can, you know, we can uh, become virtuous through our own agency. And I think that the, the, the great awakening is a Pelagian movement. It feels that, that, that it is possible for people to become virtuous and to become perfect. But the, the problem with that for, for, for is that if you are convinced of your own virtue, if you're convinced of your own rectitude, and you are convinced that it is possible to become perfect, then that means that you are in a position to sit in moral judgment on those who haven't. And I think that that, that is what, um, that's what, what, what a lot of people who, who, who find uh, a certain quality of um, moral self-satisfaction in the awakened, I think that that's what they feel. And I think that what they're feeling, what they're reacting to is the Pelagian quality of it. They're Augustinian without knowing it. Well, the other problem, of course, and you make a great point, the other problem, of course, with that mindset is that anyone who has failed to become perfect is therefore not ordinarily human, but actually is morally deficient in some way. Yes, so That's absolutely. another factor. But look, uh, Francis and I have have expressed a lot of concerns about what we've described here as the woke movement. Woke people uh, might say that being described as woke is a sort of slanderous term that it's inappropriately applied. And I, I wanted to put the counterpoint, 
uh, playing devil's advocate somewhat, you've charted the historical context of all of this, all the way from the papacy in the 11th century, the Protestant Reformation, the Enlightenment, and so on. These are all, you know, great strides in human history. Even the French Revolution, massive bloodbath, does end feudalism and we move into a sort of new uh, new world that we're all happy to live in. So are we sort of, are me, Francis, and everyone else who sort of opposes the woke stuff, are we these crusty old, uh, you know, minor nobles in revolu- pre-revolutionary France who are sort of about to witness our own demise and that's why we hate it? Well, so is that where we are? I, I mean, lurking behind this is the idea that of, of progress mm. and moral progress, yeah. so progressivism. And, and, and people very rarely stop to think, well, you know, why do we have this idea? Um, why, why do we assume that there's some kind of moral arc that's going forwards? And because, it's very hard why. Well, because, uh, because of, uh, well, I would say, and you'll correct me no doubt very shortly, but I would say it's because as we look into the last millennium, that's what we've seen. As we look into right. the last but, two but, millennia, but, broadly speaking, th- th- that's what we've seen. But, but, but um, I mean, we, we, we can talk about technical progress, yeah. but the idea of moral progress, mm. you know, where does that come from? Uh, why, why, why do we now think that, um, say, slavery is wrong or whatever? Um, and again, it it's, it's fundamentally comes down to Christian theology. And this is the weird thing that I can't, you know, I really didn't begin with any particular interest in Christianity. I had no particular interest in theology. And the kind of <laughs> dawning realisation looking at the classical world, the pre-Christian world, contemplating how different it was, how strange, how many assumptions they had that seemed totally alien to me. And I think, where do these ideas come from? And always, it's kind of like, you know, trying to find an itch on your back and then you you get to it and you scratch it. It's so good. That's <laughs> kind of what it's like. It's that, it's that strange theological ideas that cropped up, you know, centuries, often millennia ago, continue to reverberate through. It's like, I think it was at Keynes who said that, 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 People who think they've got radical new ideas that are always in hock to some defunct economist. Well, our society, we're in, we, we, we're in hock to some defunct theologian invariably. And, and the idea of progress lies in the notion that is um, basically goes all the way back to Paul, that there is a law of God. And for, for the Jews, the law of God is written you know, on the tablets uh, that got given to Moses, that in turn got given to the children of Israel. Paul says, no, actually, the law of God is written on the heart. And how do we know what that law of God is? Well, the spirit illumines it and enables us to read it. And the further corollary of that is that the more we read it, the better we become at understanding what it is. And in turn, unlike, um, uh, say, Islam, which inherits from, um, from, from, from uh, the Jews the idea that you have a mass body of law that comes directly from God and therefore kind of is eternally extant, Christians have always thought that the law is illumined by the spirit. Therefore, humans can legitimately author that and law itself will become progressive because over the course of time, human understanding of, um, of, of, of what God's law is will become better and better and better. The rules and can sense, change. Yeah, as it, and, improve and improve is the point. Yeah, exactly. it, improve is the point. Yes. So, so, so slavery is the, is the obvious example. So people always say, well, you know, why, why did it take so long for Christians to decide um, to get rid of slavery, that slavery was wrong? I mean, Christians always thought slavery was, was, was wrong, um, but in the same way that they thought kind of disease or poverty was wrong. But they just kind of assumed that it was part of, 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 of what it is to be mortal. It's part of the inheritance of the fall. Um, but what happened in the 18th century was that, the, again, we talked about these very distinctive Protestant idea, understanding of the spirit, which is that you read the text of scripture, the spirit illumines you, and um, your understanding of what is written there will transcend the kind of the, the, the base meaning. So the Bible nowhere says get rid of slavery. It nowhere says slavery is, 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 is as an institution should be abolished. But Christians from that Protestant tradition read the scriptures and came to the conclusion that slavery was was evil. And they did that chiefly because they were living in societies that had pushed the institution of slavery to a kind of hideously mechanized degree. So you could put up with, you know, slavery where it was two or three people, um, you know, in a village or something. But where you've got 
institutionalized mass torture and and transportation the horror of it began to percolate through and to stimulate the consciences of people who were witnessing it and furthermore on top of that it became racialized because slavery previously hadn't been racialized um, you know, there were there were lots of white slaves in the early days of the colonies in America, but increasingly, um, because slaves came to, to be exclusively from African, that also served to unsettle the consciences of, of of white Christians because they knew that, you know, they tried to kind of manufacture reasons why why Africans should be enslaved and and, and uh, Europeans should be the masters, but they couldn't really do it, and and so the strain of that ultimately enabled. Um, first Quakers and then evangelicals to convince themselves that God was against slavery. And then having done that, to agitate and push for its abolition. And the the abolitionist movement really is the model for for, for every socially concerned progressive movement that has followed since. It kind of, you know, in in, in 1814, um, mass agitation across Britain forced the Foreign Secretary, Lord Castlereagh, at the Congress of Vienna after the defeat of Napoleon in 1814, to go there. And even though he didn't want to do it, it was kind of like Theresa May having to go and argue for Brexit, even though she didn't want to do it. She had to, same way Castlereagh had to, because he had this mass agitation going on behind him in London and across the country, to go and ask all the other powers, we've got to get rid of slavery. You know, you've got to sign up to it. Um, and you know that that's that's kind of the model and, and 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 which of us would want to live in a world where slavery was morally acceptable so you know it's but at the same time um the, the, there is a kind of temptation i suppose where um you you can end up being in love with your own feeling of virtue and that that is also you know that's a temptation i think that 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 people who are are pushing progressive causes always have to be alert to and and that's something that christians historically have always been aware they've always contemplated that they might be sinners themselves that 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 to to be overly convinced of your own virtue is in itself you know to cease to be virtuous and i think that the 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 collapse of doctrinal christianity the 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 retreat of overt belief the collapse of doctrines like uh, original sin have kind of bred perhaps a, a, a degree of moral overconfidence on the part of people who feel that they are furthering progressive causes. Have you ever been abroad and felt out of place because you didn't speak the language? No, because I voted Brexit, mate. Brexit (laughs) means Brexit. Uh, I know that when you go on holiday, sometimes you don't speak the language. It can feel really awkward. A little bit like Francis talking to a woman. Do you want to learn another language? Now, I don't for obvious reasons, but if you do, then Babbel is quite simply one of the finest apps to use to achieve your goal. It is. It's got amazing, simple to use interface. They've got daily 10 to 15 minute lessons that you can do that have been proven effective in many studies as a great way to learn one of 14 languages that they offer. So it doesn't matter if you've got struggle with language for a variety of different reasons. Maybe you find it tough or maybe you're just English. Right now, Babbel is offering Trigonometry fans six months completely free. All you got to do is head over there, get the six-month subscription, and use our special code, which is, of course, Trigger. Go to babbel.co.uk slash play and use the promo code Trigger on your six-month subscription. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot co dot UK forward slash play and use the code Trigger. And we're not going to explain how to spell the word Trigger because that would be patronizing. I guess what I'm really getting that tom when i when i said are we opposing this great progressive movement that's going to change the world for the better is is there such a thing as too much progress i mean i would argue well, that in the soviet union the the creation of the soviet union was in some ways inspired by very progressive ideas about equality about emancipation of women actually it was very progressive on that front for uh, for its time but it ended up being, we know what, right? So can you have too much progress? Well, it, it, it depends what your, what your starting assumptions are. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, to the Romans, the idea that, that um, you know, um, men shouldn't be dominant over women, um, that Romans shouldn't rule and barbarians be subordinate would, would, would have seemed grotesque. 
uh, we are the heirs of, of, of very different moral assumptions. Um, but by and large, the things that we tend to as- take for granted, that we just assume are right because it seems self-evident that they're right, is because we are the heirs of, of, of 2,000 years of, of, of Christian teachings on this. And this was kind of famously, notoriously pointed out by Nietzsche, who, who detested Christianity because he, he um, you know, unlike, unlike uh, most atheists today, um, who, who, who tend to identify themselves with progressive causes, um, Nietzsche detested uh, Christianity because of its moral teachings. He, 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 he thought that Christianity had um, kind of gelded and impaired uh, the blonde beast, that the power and the beauty <laughs> and the strength and the potency of the, of, 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 of the strong had been neutered by Christianity, that by elevating the weak, by um, kind of putting the slave above the master, society had been ruined and destroyed. Um, and I, that was a perspective that enabled Nietzsche to see that um, socialists, communists, humanists, progressives, you know, all of them, basically, even though they may say that they were reacting against Christianity, in their fundamentals were deeply Christian. And Tom, we seem to have got into this habit, I mean, you touched on it uh, when you were speaking there, of judging historical figures on present day values. And I I would just like to explore with you, why is that? Why do we suddenly feel the need to look at people like Churchill or Gandhi and go, so, you know, he's, he's racist, even though they lived 60, 70, 80 years ago. And obviously society at that point was completely different. Because, well, because we have a progressive sense of morality, we have a sense that, that things move forwards. And so our sense of what is right feels different to, to, to the moral standards that people held. You know, I mean, not just kind of, you know, 80 years ago, but kind of like two years ago in many cases. Um, and I think that um, on top of that, um, there is there that the, the, there's a there's a kind of um, well again, again it goes back to the the the, the kind of the, the 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 reluctance to accept that everyone has imperfections you know no one is perfect and um, there is no one who is who is going to be morally impeachable and I think that 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 it's kind of those two impulses have kind of snarled up. And mean that there's, there's a huge temptation to sit and judge moral judgment of, of people of, of previous generations, and it's something that really kind of again kicked in in the '60s, where you know the long-haired teenagers would sit in moral judgment on the parents who'd won the Second World War. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, 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 and we, you know, we've all done that. You know, that's that's what becoming a teenager was. Teenagers mm. like that didn't really exist before the '60s, so we've all been teenagers in that society. We know what fun it is to sit in judgment on our parents and to regard them as, you know, square and hmm. whatever. Uh, and it's just the kind of acceleration of that process. But isn't it, doesn't it belie a certain kind of arrogance? Because the reality is that in 100, 200 years' time, the, you know, future generations will look at what we do in abject horror, you know, the fact that a lot of our clothes are made in the third world, made by people who have paid an absolute pittance. We eat factory farmed meat and all the rest of it. Yes, I, th- I think that the, the risk of hypocrisy is enormous. And again, that's always been, that's always been the problem <laughs> with Christianity, <laughs> is that, is that the, 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 the threat of hypocrisy is, is always there. So, um, you know, there's, the, there's, there's a campaign to get rid of the statue of Thomas Guy, Mm. who founded Guy's Hospital. Sounds like an absolutely dreadful human being. <laughs> yes. So he, he, you know, he, 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 he ploughed his, his money into a hospital. Uh, he was very committed to the idea of public health at a time when obviously there wasn't a national health service or anything like that. Um, but he had investments that were in the South Sea Company and the South Sea Company in turn in, uh, invested money in uh, slavery. Um, so there are... Today, and I know because I've seen them, people who, um, when statues get toppled, take photos on their iPhones or film it on their iPhones. Mm. And I, you know, Apple has been accused of benefiting from 
the slavery of the, the Uyghurs uh, in, in China. Um, it, it seems to me exactly the same. The risk is, it seems, you know, the nature of the, the world that we live in, the, the, the insidious character of, of capitalism mm. means that it's almost impossible to do something that is not in some way complicit in the, the oppression and the enslavement of people who are less fortunate than, up, than us, uh, which is exactly what, what, what Thomas Guy did. Thomas Guy made money indisputably from a form of capitalism that we would now regard as, as morally unacceptable, but he plowed it back into something that continues to benefit um, people to this day. And I think that, that we should allow his statue to stand because in a way, his example, the example of someone who was complicit in uh, capitalism, um, gives us the reassurance that you can do that but still achieve noble things that continue to, to echo into the present day. I think that, that, that not to do that risks blinding our eyes to the way that we are all, you know, we are all, we live in a first world country. We are unbelievably privileged by the standards of Uyghurs, of um, people whose lives are being turned up by the need to mine obscure uh, metals or products in, in, in Africa or wherever. Um, we are all therefore complicit, you know, the comfortable lives that we lead. We are implicated in the exploitation and the oppression that enables us to lead our lives and to go on our phones and to send out campaigning tweets going on about how virtuous we are. We need to remember. And I think that that is, you know, that's what I find uh, in a way, you know, I've become a, big, I've become a big fan of the idea of original sin. I think the idea that we are all morally complicit, we're all morally stained, we've all got to, to be aware of that, is, is an incredible, powerful idea. And isn't it the problem as well is that a lot of people in this country, because of our education system, also you know, in places like the United States, we are historically illiterate. We don't know enough about these subjects that we talk about. So we talk about slavery and it tends to be, oh, it was the British who invented slavery. You know, oh, it was the British Empire. They, they were the only ones that did slavery. When the reality is, is that I've said this before on the podcast, but if you wanted to get anything done at one point, you needed slaves. Yes. I, I mean, I think that there's, there's, um, there's a kind of, um, it, it's not so much historical literacy as solipsism. It, it, it's an absolute preoccupation with, with us, with our society. Um, so nobody, um, nobody doubts that um, an innocent man dying at the hands of a, a policeman is a crime. Um, but is it as, is it so terrible that the response it generates should necessarily be greater than say the sufferings of a people like the, the Yazidis? And I, I went to, to Iraq in, um, uh, 2016 and, um, uh, visited, um, sites where, men had been crucified, where women had been enslaved or shot, um, and went to a refugee camp and spoke to a, a guy who um, had been away when uh, ISIS turned up and took their, took his, his, two of his sons, two of his daughters and his wife. And he said, um, you know, his, his daughters were still owned at that time, uh, enslaved. You know, they were kind of nine and 11, I think. So he knew that they were be, kind of being raped every day. Um, his sons had, had been indoctrinated. So again, they were very young. They would grow up, um, convinced that it was right to exterminate him, to shoot him, mm. you know, so he'd lost them completely. Um, his wife had been raped, um, by her owner. Uh, then the owner had shot her through the head, uh, hadn't killed her, but had left her, um, you know, terribly damaged. So through a series of middlemen, he'd managed to buy her back. And as I was talking to him, his wife was behind a curtain, moaning and beating her head against the concrete floor. Now, that's a level of suffering. You know, I, I, I had never experienced, I'd never been up close against anyone who'd suffered anything like that. And I said to him, 
we were making a film about it and I thought that may, maybe the film would have an impact, raise the profile of this. And I said, I, you know, I really hope for, that this film will, will have an impact. And he said, I don't think anyone's going to care. And I said, I, I really think it will because you, what you've been through, what your people have been through is just shocking and terrible. And I just don't think that people know. And he said, they don't know because they don't care. You know, you've got, you've got uh, Muslims in, in Britain and um, Muslims will, will make the case for Muslim, Muslim suffering. And you have Christians in Britain and Christians in Britain will make the case for the suffering of Christians in the Middle East. Um, but there are no Yazidis. Nobody cares about us. And, and he's right, he was right. He was right. We don't really care. We can't bear too much reality. We can cope with the suffering of people who are basically like us. So this is what we're really talking about then is self-flagellation on a national scale? Um, I, th- I think that... I, I, I guess that, that, that we... that Black Lives Matter kicked in, as with, with Me Too movement, because these are things that, that we in our society perhaps can affect. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the... But, but the risk is, is that we... Um, we come to see them somehow as being um, more terrible than they are, more significant than they are, because in a way that then dignifies us. It, it keeps us center stage. It keeps us as the focus. It's all about us. And that's, I think, particularly true with America, because America is, you know, it's, it's, it's the great cultural hub of the world. So what happens in America reverberates in a way that it doesn't with other countries. So there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of moral imperialism about it. You know, a dead American matters a million times more than a dead Yazidi. Mm. Mm. And, and d- why do you think that is? Is it just the fact that we connect with them because they're very similar to us, they speak the same language, et cetera, et cetera? Or is it also as well because when we look at America, we're instantly reminded of our own childhood experiences, the films, you know, the clothing, the, the propaganda, whatever, it, whatever else it may be? Yeah, I, th- I, I think that, um, I, th- I mean, I think a crucial part of it, I think, I think all that's true. Mm. I, I, and, and I think that, that speaking English means that you are always being kind of tugged along in the wake of, of, of America's psychodramas. And a, a huge part of the, the impact of, of um, mo- America's moral convulsions, you know, from the 60s right the way up to the present day, is, is a kind of cultural cringe on the part of Britain. You know, we, we kind of want to be like America. Um, so, you, you know, you'll get people here talking about the feds. I mean, it's, 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 and it's kind of embarrassing. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, And, you know, we, we, you know, and and here when we talk about the police, you know, you, there seems almost a kind of disappointment that that there aren't more armed police Mm. in the streets of Britain. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the difference between, you know, Route 66 and the A303. You know, British <laughs> British life is somehow less glamorous. <laughs> it's smaller. It's I mean, and and the moral causes in America are kind of more dramatic. Um, and I think that 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 means that that uh, ironically, considering how 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 um, very uh, op- opposed to American cultural imperialism people on the left are. Um, at the moment, they seem the most colonized by America. And what does, if we look through history, which is your job, uh, what does history tell us about not only the present, but also the future of where we are? Well, it, it, it doesn't tell us. <laughs> because, Great question, be, be, Mike. Because there are, you know, there, are, there are kind of hard and fast rules that we follow through. Of course. Have you ever read... Um, Asimov's foundation series, yes. science fiction series, where uh, this guy is able to extrapolate hard and fast rules mm. and work out exactly what's going to happen. And even then it gets messed up because you get this mutant who turns up and screws everything up. Um, but, what I would, obviously, but, but obviously <laughs> you, can, you can trace patterns. Yeah. And, and so what I would say about the present is um, uh, that looking specifically at... Um, the awakened 
you know, what's what's is it, do we have an awoken future, or will the forces of reaction kick in? You know, what's what what's going to happen? Um, I think that, that helpfully or unhelpfully, there are, there are two possible paradigms there. And one, one is that the, the, the process that happened in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation, because what happened in the Protestant Reformation was that um, various, by the standards of early 16th century um, Catholic England, various radicals seized control of the commanding heights of power um, in, in, in government and particularly in the universities. And although there was indeed a kind of incredible force of reaction, say Mary's reign, Bloody Mary, where Protestants got burnt at Smithfields and so on, um, that got overturned. And by the end of the 16th century, the end of Elizabeth's reign, Protestantism had completely bedded in. The the universities were completely, um, everyone in the university essentially was was Protestant. Um, You know, the poets, the thinkers... Um, the politicians, um, the commanding heights were completely Protestant. And from that point on, England was basically irrevocably Protestant. The commanding heights had been captured. Against that, Protestantism in England had its extremes. And the extreme that the people always know is the Puritans. And Puritans ended up feeling that, you know, it was a movement that, 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 that ended up peaking and then fading and kind of dissolving into the, the, the cultural mainstream. There aren't any Puritans now. There are Puritan elements, perhaps. Um, so I, I suppose the question is, you know, is, is, um, is, is, is the movements that we've seen over this decade, um, is it an equivalent of the Protestant Reformation, in which case the whole of society will be reconfigured mm-hmm. and we're just at the start of it. And people who grumble about the woke are the equivalent of, you know, Thomas More, <laughs> you know, um, or uh, are, are they the equivalent of the Puritans? Are they a kind of spike of something that is more broadly a trend that will peak and then fade down? And I, I don't know the answer to that. And Tom, um, you, you, you mentioned the Puritans, and obviously, you know, the, the, you said there's no more Puritans, but amongst this new awoken movement, as you, as you call it, surely there's shades of Puritanism in there. Completely, yes. And, and I think that's another reason why, um, why Britain is particularly susceptible to, um, to, to, to the kind of moral um, impulses in America, the moral revolutions in America, because ultimately the, the, the uh, American moral um, perspectives, um, dramas, mythology, if you like, is, is ultimately comes from England. And, and there are two kind of main sources. One of them is um, the, the, the Quakers in, in Pennsylvania, and the other is the Puritans in New England. And those are you know, they still reverberate very, very strongly. So, and it leads to all kinds of paradoxes. So the, um, there's much to admire about Puritanism. It's, it's become a dirty word, but there's much to, to admire about it. And for instance, um, something we haven't talked about quite as much as Black Lives Matter, but the Me Too movement. Mm. Um, the Me Too movement is founded on the idea that um, every woman has the right to control her body that her body is hers to do with as she wishes, and that no man has the right to kind of use it as a physical object. And that in turn requires men to exercise um, self-control. And this is something that Puritans were very into. Puritans were not opposed to sex. They were very into marital sex. I mean, very into it. So they were against sex. But they, they, but they <laughs> no, abso- abso- ab- ab- abso- absolutely not. Absolutely. I mean, you know, they, they, they were they were very keen on finding ways to keep the uh, to keep the the juices flowing to a long and happy married life. Oh, really? Yes. To, 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 in ways that, that you know are often quite you know you look at Paradise Lost and Milton's account of of Adam and Eve and that it's you know it's, it's quite juicy, um, and. Um, but what they were against was the idea that, that, that predatory men should have the right to, you know, essentially use women as they wanted. And, and um, in the wake of, of, the, of, 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 of the, the protectorate, feet of Cromwell, you know, death of Cromwell, the overthrow of the protectorate, the return of Charles II. Charles II is a merry monarch. He comes with the Cavaliers. The whole thing about Charles II is he has sex with everyone mm-hmm. and all the Cavaliers have sex with everyone. And it's a kind of rape culture. And 
Puritanism stands against that. Mm. Um, now, what happened in the 60s was a kind of repudiation of, of that Christian idea that, 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 um, that men should necessarily not touch women. And so you have this great festival of sex, of which, you know, so you have groupies, you have Rolling Stones sleeping with underage groupies, and it's all tremendously cool. Um, and it, 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 there's a kind of licensing, a, a kind of sexual license. Um, but the Me Too movement was a massive reaction against that. And it was a slamming of the brakes, and it was a return, essentially, to the Puritan idea that men should properly exercise continence and and self-control when it came to their relations with women and what was fascinating about that was that america and indeed england remained sufficiently puritan that most men accepted the justice of that it kind of got enshrined as you know got the whole reason that it had resonance wasn't wasn't just that women bought into it men did as well now the, the the brilliant the kind of the Moebius strip that we inhabit at the moment in our relationship with this, this Christian inheritance is exemplified by the fact that when you had all the women's marches, I think in the kind of the first, was it um, 26, 2016, 2017, it was the kind of the first... Post-Trump, I think. Yeah, so it was Trump's, after Trump's inauguration. Um, the most dramatic uh, demonstrators, the ones that really stuck out, kind of blaze of colour were women wearing red robes and white headdresses like handmaids from the drama series of Margaret Atwood's novel, The Handmaid's Tale, which was um, a, a kind of riff on New England Puritanism. So they were dressing up <laughs> in the costumes of characters from a parody of Puritanism to demand that Puritanism be reinstated. And... That's kind of where we are at the moment, <laughs> is that we, as societally, we have an incredibly conflicted relationship to this. Be- I think because we, we've, we've forgotten the, th- the theological underpinnings of, of why, what it is and why it is that we think the way we do. So there's a kind of, a kind of moral free-for-all. Really. So let's, let's say you, you flick a switch, you, Tom Holland, flick the, the great switch of human civilization, and everyone son- suddenly becomes aware of this inheritance. What what would happen, and and how would that what would well, that I, look like? I I think um, what is it that we need to learn? Is getting, okay, is so, so I think I think I think that that you know another interesting question is why why do we no longer need why do we think we no longer need this Christian inheritance? You know, Christianity's fall, doctrinal Christianity mm. has fallen off a cliff, mm. particularly you know first in Europe, now increasingly in America, and, and it happened in the sixties very precipitately. Suddenly, people stop going to church. People stop believing this stuff, um, and the, the decline has gone on. And, you know, not in the rest of the world, but in Europe and, and increasingly in America, people just aren't interested in Christianity at all. And, and, and I think that one of the major reasons for this um, is that it happens in the wake of the, the Second World War and the Nazis and the discovery of the Holocaust, and. Again, the question that, that, that perhaps is not often asked is, and I'm aware that this could be cut out and used, <laughs> is what was so wrong about the Nazis? That's the title of the episode, guys. So there you go. I was, gonna, I was gonna say, the only way this could have been worse, if you'd said the caller cost, which some people say happened. So, so, <laughs> so, the, 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 so the Nazis, um, un, unlike say the French revolutionaries mm. or the Russian revolutionaries, they were the first, the fascists, so Mussolini, but particularly Hitler, mm. were the first um, European regimes to repudiate not just doctrinal Christianity, but the moral fundamentals of Christianity. And the Nazis trampled down two kind of the, 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 the two animating, moral animating principles of Christianity. The first, the idea that um, the weak have a purchase on the strong. You know, exemplified by the figure of Christ on the cross. The cross is an emblem of Roman imperial power, but it's, it's not the, the torturer, it's the man who's getting tortured. It's not the master, it's the slave. Um, and so this idea that the, the weak, the, 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 the oppressed, the suffering, kind of are closer to God than the powerful, is something very fundamental to Christianity. It's there very clearly in the French Revolution. It's there very clearly in the Russian Revolution. Nazis completely repudiate that. 
they, you know, they're like, they're with Nietzsche. They think this is contemptible and, and terrible. And the other thing, of course, is, is this Pauline teaching that there is no Jew or Greek. Nazis completely think that Jews and Greeks are very, very different. And uh, indeed, that the Jews have to be destroyed so that they can't infect the Greeks. So just to, just to pause you there, to, to convert that into simple language, the core tenets of Christianity is that all men are created equal, more, yeah. more or less. Yeah. And that the, you, you want to overthrow the structures of oppression, to use modern language, as, yeah. as opposed to creating a structure of oppression that is meritocratic, quote unquote, and putting yeah. in quote. Where the strong have the whip hand over the Exactly. Whip. Yeah. Whereas the Nazis, they overthrow both of those. They yeah. say some people are better than others, and those that are better should yeah. rule over the weak. Yeah, and the Nazis don't do this because they, they wake up and think, let's be evil. They do this because they think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. For, 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 for the German people, for, 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 for the, the Nordic people, the Aryan people. Yeah. This is the right thing to do. Mm. Um, now, so, so, so that experiment implodes horribly. Um, and the Western world has to live with the shock, which, which, which reverberates because of the discovery of what they've been doing in the death camps. Mm. And the impact of this, which really starts to kick in in the 60s again, and everything happens in the 60s, it's the great fulcrum point. It's the great revolutionary turning point. Um, what, what, what happens is that um, whereas previously people would say, well, what would Jesus do and then do it? They, we don't need that anymore because now we ask what would Hitler do and we do the opposite. So it, it's still huh. Christian That's really because we, we regard Hitler as Satan, we regard the Nazis as the devils for Christian reasons, because they trample down Christian moral codes. Mm. But we don't need Christianity anymore. We've got Hitler, we've got the Nazis. And that has been a, a, a constant, really since the 60s, that you know, fascist, Hitler, Nazi, is, 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 is the ultimate insult. And, and so it remains to this day. Um, you know, I, so, so, so essentially, the the um, I think I think that 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 um, say what's happening in America at the moment. There's a moral panic on the part of the right, and people can recognise that as moral panic, because we know that Christians do moral panic. That's what they always do. But there's a moral panic on the left as well, and it's it's basically it's the same because their moral panic is that everyone is a Nazi. So and what's the people, right's moral so the, panic? Hmm? What's the right's moral panic? Well, the right's moral panic is that, you know, um, uh, order is going down the pan and um, people aren't doing what they should do. The revolution is upon us. Yeah, the revolution is upon us and, mm. you know, we need to retrench and everything, you know, it's all terrible. Mm. But, but, but the left's moral panic or the hard left's moral panic is that, um, is, is, is that literally Nazis are waiting to take over the country. I mean, it's the same here. I mean, people saying Boris Johnson is a Nazi. <laughs> you know, he's not, he's, not, you know, I mean, he's awful in all kinds of ways, but he's clearly not a Nazi. Hmm. And, you, you know, you've got, you've, got, you've got people roaming American streets and people are dying and people are celebrating, saying, I'm not going to mourn the death of a, of a fascist. Um, th th there are no fascists, exactly as there were no witches. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly as, as uh, actually, there weren't any kind of, there weren't Cathar heretics. The whole thing was kind of manufactured. And you get these, what, again and again through Christian history, you get this conviction that you get um, kind of university educated progressive elites who get ahead of the vast mass of the people. So it happens in, in the 13th century. University-educated clerics have a progressive, um, intellectually demanding understanding of what being a Christian should be about. And they come to see the left behind, the peasants, the people who live out in the, the kind of the country of, you know, of, of, around Albi as, as deplorables. And they come to think that these are people who are worshipping some dualist god. They construct it completely. You know, there was no Cathar heresy. It was complete invention of, of, of the inquisitors. But, you know, you look for it and you find it. Same with the witch craze. You know, there were no witches, but brilliantly educated, highly educated people, progressive Protestants looked around, saw that there were people who, who, who were still clinging on to kind of what they saw as antiquated modes of behaviour 
and said, well, they're in league with the devil. You know, these are these are people who it's not it's not just, you know, it's not that they are simply not as clever or educated as us. It's they're going out and they're kissing the, the you know, the arse of the devil and swallowing his ice cold semen. And therefore we must burn them. <laughs> and essentially, I think what's happening now is exactly the same, that 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 we don't have devils anymore. And so we can we can laugh at, at uh, you know, Christian inquisitors or um Puritan divines who thought that devils actually existed or heretics existed. But I think that the idea that there's some enormous Nazi conspiracy in Western countries and that the Nazis are just waiting to take over is is quite as much a fantasy. And it it reflects the fact that for us, Hitler and the Nazis have replaced Satan and the legions of hell. You mentioned the right, Tom. I just want to finish off this point before we move on. Uh, You said it was a moral panic on the right. The revolution is upon us, all of this thing. Is there no, I mean, we've talked about the the historical equivalent of the Protestant Reformation, this great change against whatever system had been in place before. Would the right not be right to be concerned about what's happening now as a sort of attempt to, certainly if you were to take some of the the, the hard left at their word, they want to overthrow everything, don't they? Well, so so, so the toppling of statues, for instance, um, people say they're trying to erase history. Yeah, I think that's an exaggeration. but, But to a degree, I mean, you know, the, the, the idea that you um, that you purify society and you improve society by getting rid of the symbols of, of of what you're rejecting again is something that 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 has happened through Christian history. Um, I mean, personally, I I, I I I wouldn't legislate for mobs to go around tearing down the statues of slavers uh, because I think in many ways the impact was greater for the fact that um, that it was illegal. Um, but you know, I. I I'm perfectly happy to see that statue go, Colston statue go. Yeah. I'm perfectly happy to see Confederate statues go. I don't, you know, they were put up at a time where people well knew, you know, Colston statue was put up at a time where people knew that um, slavery was wrong. It was put up at the end of the 19th century. The Confederate statues were put up, I clearly in a kind of, I think with a, a racist intent. So I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, and so to that extent, I think that, that, the toppling of statues does is the expression of an attempt to rewrite history, and it, it's it's an attempt to rewrite history in a progressive way. Yeah, um, I don't, I'm not so talking about the statue, but 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 but, 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 but it's also broadly. complicated by the well. So um, he was devastated, so, by the way, when the statue came down. I really was. <laughs> I, I, well, my concern okay, is the same but, as yours, but, which but, is but, is it done democratically or not? That's the only. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we 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 have. So I was born in in 1968, and. I have lived through a period of moral and ethical change that I think is unprecedented in human history, the speed and totality of it. So I, can't, so I, I, I was born just after homosexuality had been legalised. And now, essentially, to think that homosexuality should be illegal is illegal. And the speed and transformation of that is, is enormous. And there were people on the right who were horrified by it and appalled by it. And it still causes problems for, you know, for, for churches, for instance. But I think that um, one of, one of the, 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 the triumphs of the spirit of, of, of the progressive is that there, there are now very few people on the right who would be opposed, say, to... I mean, I think, I think that the idea of gay marriage is completely, pretty much universally... People on the right, you know, it was a conservative prime minister who who who, who legislated for it, um, and I think a huge part of the 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 snarl up over trans issues is is precisely a kind of feeling of of societal shame that that society did what it did to to, to gay people when um, you know there seems now from our perspective to have been no reason for it. It seems a terrible thing to have done. Mm. Um, but 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 equally, so, so, so I think to that extent, people. Are, if, if if you define people on the right as being people who want to, def, to defend um, a tradition, no matter what, and I think that's a very old-fashioned notion of the right. I mean, you know, I don't think conservatives conserve at all. Um, conservatives are often the most revolutionary people you meet. Um, but I think that kind of old fashioned conservative, the cons- you know, the reactionary, if you want to say, I think reactions, reactionaries are right. You know, we've this this has been a period of change like no other. And what a fascinating place to end the interview. We end our interviews 
with the same question every time. And of course it is. Take it away, Constantine. What's the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be? Well, I mentioned conservatives don't conserve. Um, and uh, recording this in the week when uh, Extinction Rebellion have returned to the streets. And I think that um, Extinction Rebellion isn't adequately a rebellion against extinction because I think um, both on the left and the right, we are ignoring the the detail of what is happening in this country's country, this Britain's countryside, which is that we are, as a people, the most nature-loving people anywhere, if you judge it by the number of people who belong to wildlife um, conservation charities. And yet we have the most um, ecologically denuded landscape in Europe. Um, we cannot lecture people much poorer countries on their need to conserve wildlife when we are allowing um, hedgehogs to plummet towards extinction, when our rivers are being poisoned, when uh, songbirds are vanishing. And this was a, a, a topic that people briefly woke up to during the lockdown when suddenly there was no traffic and people could hear birdsong and people realised they valued and, and, and wanted it. Um, but now that... Um, uh, blood is returning to the limbs of the economy, that sense that we share this country with other species and that, in a sense, we're trust holders for them is fading again. And I think that that's what we should be talking about. I think that that there is an extinction crisis, but I think that talking about it in the broad brush terms that Extinction Rebellion do misses the fact that we need to concentrate on the specifics. So you're talking about conservationism? Yeah, I'm talking about um, the need for a mass national effort to say, for instance, to stop hedgehogs from going extinct. The way if I if I if I if I were prime minister, I would write it into law that um, there's an, an obligation on the government to reverse the decline in hedgehog numbers. And hedgehogs are a bellwether species. If you reverse them, then you reverse other things as well. You have to put in, you know, you have to Im improve. The environment for hedgehogs to survive, you have to make sure they're insects, everything follows from that. That's what I would do. That to me is a terrible pressing issue that, that we don't talk about nearly enough. And it seemed like a kind of, you know, uh, gimmicky thing that doesn't really matter. But to me, it's fundamental. Mm. Well, the way the internet works, you shall henceforth be known as the hedgehog man. <laughs> the hedgehog historian is how yeah. you'll be known forever. But Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. If people want to buy a book, it's called Dominion. Uh, and if what they want to follow uh, your many musings on Twitter, where do they go for that? Uh, they go to at Holland underscore Tom. And is there any, anywhere else they should go? They should. Uh, you should all head to uh, bookshops and uh, buy Dominion. I was going to say, you were going to, I, I expected you to say something about hedgehogs, but you, you did well to avoid it. Uh, Tom, thank you very much again. And thank you for watching. We'll see you very soon with another brilliant episode, which go out on Wednesdays and Sundays or a live stream, Francis. Which goes out on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. And they're all at 7 p.m. UK time. Take care and see you soon, guys. Thanks for watching, guys. As always, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click the bell button next to the subscribe button so you get notified when a video comes out. And follow us on all the social media at TriggerPod. And also leave us a nice review on iTunes and spread the word.